Welcome to the sixth episode of History Bites in 2022. My name is Dawn Owen and I am the curator of Guelph Museums. History Bites is a one hour long casual conversation during which we chat about the latest news, exhibitions and other happenings at Guelph Museums. History Bites airs on the museum's Facebook uh, Live every month. A recording of today's program will be available through the Museum Everywhere portal on our website and on our socials after the broadcast. I'm recording today's uh, program in Guelph, Ontario. Before I introduce and welcome our guests, I'd like to focus our thoughts within an awareness and acknowledgement of the land. Guelph is located on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The place we now call Guelph is on land that is described in the Between the Lakes Purchase Number no. 3 Treaty of 1792, an agreement between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown concerning over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to doing more to learn, share and support truth and healing. When we gather, we spend time in conversation about the land, its history and its peoples. We grow our knowledge and our relationships with our treaty partner, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and with the many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who call Guelph home. This informs all that we do at the museum and underscores our commitment to each other today and for the health and well-being of future generations. Today I'm in conversation with three contributors to a major research initiative called Where the Rivers Meet, Decolonizing Place Narratives, a multi-year project guided by Indigenous scholars at the University of Guelph and funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, in partnership with a growing community of participants, including Guelph Museums. With the goal of decentering colonial histories and countering centuries of ind Indigenous eraser, erasure, the project explores Indigenous relationships to the rivers and surrounding lands in the city of Guelph to uncover, develop and share decolonizing narratives in the place where the Speed and Aramasa rivers meet. Land relationships and collaborative and co-creative partnerships among Indigenous and non-Indigenous community in understandings of land and place are becoming more frequent However, dominant civic narratives and public discourses continue to center settler uh, histories and marginalize the historic and ongoing presence of Indigenous peoples in Guelph. Co-led by an elder from Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, an emerging artist from Six Nations of the Grand River, and urban Indigenous residents and scholars in Guelph, and, uh, in Guelph their research poses this question. How can Indigenous relationships with and along the Speed and Aramasa rivers reshape understandings of the city of Guelph as an Indigenous place? So on History Bites today, I'm joined by Alex Jacobs Bloom, Amina Lalore, and Ashley Martin. Together we will consider and reflect on this important question. So it's my great pleasure at, at this point to uh, welcome each of our guests and share a little bit about who they are. And I'll start with you, Alex. So Alex Jacobs Bloom of the Lower Cayuga Nation of Six Nations of the, of the Grand River Territory and of mixed uh, European heritage is an emerging artist and curator. Alex's photo based practice explores the duality of her identity through visual storytelling. Her work is focused on the land that has sustained her family for generations. She navigates indigeneity, reclamation, resiliency, and healing while challenging colonial uh, structure, structures. Alex is currently Indigenous Curatorial Resident at Hamilton Artists Inc. And I am delighted to welcome Alex to the program. Hi, Alex. Hi, Scano everyone. Um, it's really great to be back on History Bites and I'm just so excited about this conversation and to share space with you all. Um, thank you so much, Dawn, for inviting me back. I am absolutely thrilled you're here. It's my pleasure to introduce Amina Lalore, who is mixed Vietnamese Irish Métis designer and researcher based in Toronto on Treaty th excuse me, 13 within the Dish with One Spoon territory. 
Amina carries the role of research project manager for Nocum's House, a proposed Indigenous land-based research lab at the University of Guelph, led by Indigenous scholars Dr. Kim Anderson, Dr. Sherry Longboat, and Dr. Brittany Luby. Amina is also an adjunct instructor at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture, where, she, where prior she earned a Bachelor of Architectural Studies and a Master of Architecture. She is currently teaching a, a second year elective course titled Building Kinship, Land-Based Community Engagement in Design. Amina's continued research explores the meaning of practicing architecture and design in a good way on Indigenous lands within a violently imposed settler colonial context. Welcome, Amina. Thanks so much for joining History Bites. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really, really grateful to be here uh, with all of you and excited for the conversation to come. So thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome Ashley Martin to History Bites. Ashley of Listigush First Nation and Mixed Heritage is a research assistant in Dr. Kim Anderson's lab, currently completing her undergraduate degree in international development at the University of Guelph. Ashley's studies focus on agricultural development while her work centers around coming to understand themes of indigeneity and decolonization. Welcome, Ashley. Hello. Hi. I'm so excited to be here and so grateful for the opportunity. Um, and like the other said, I'm very excited for the conversation to come. So thank you for having me. Well, thanks so much for being here. And truly, it is my pleasure. Um, I'm deeply honored to be in this conversation with the three of you and to be uh, part of the, the larger team working in this uh, in this research capacity. And I know that over the long lens of time, we'll we'll learn a lot together. Um, and then we'll bring those learnings to our broader communities uh, and including uh, the community that uh, that visits the museum. So I'm so, so thrilled to be chatting with you today. Um, my first question is really for each of you um, to describe your roles within the research project. So maybe we'll start with you, Alex. Yeah, uh, my role is um, community researcher and curator. Um, the community research aspect will be engaging in data collection and arts and land based knowledge mobilization activities. And I'm a photographer as well, so I'll be documenting these activities as well for the exhibition. And as a curator, I will be collaborating with the team and um, to develop an exhibition to further disseminate the knowledge collected throughout the project, you know, to share with community. And I'll be bringing my knowledge and my values as a Haudenosaunee artist and curator um, and those decentering practice that I, I utilize in my work as well. I'm so excited. I can't wait till we get to the exhibition making part of our journey, but I uh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, Amina, uh, can you describe your role, please, in the research project? Sure. Uh, so I, I'm a research associate uh, at the University of Guelph. Um, of course, primarily working on Nookum's House, but I work with Kim, uh, Kim Anderson and Brittany Luby, um, just on supporting other research work too. So, so I, I will be kind of, I guess, in terms of my my role, I'm I'm more of kind of a supportive role. I think throughout this process, I I'm going to be. I guess we're kind of trying to figure out exactly how, how I'm going to kind of continue to work through this because I'm also shifting a little bit. I've been working as a research associate um, for a few a couple years now, I guess, on the project. I started out working in all this uh, in all of this area with as a graduate research assistant while I was still working on my master's. So um, so yeah, generally I um, I'll be kind of supporting the process. I helped, you know, write the application for this. I'll, I'll be continuing to work, uh, I think, work on the research and, and the exhibition, but some of that is to be determined still. But I do bring, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a designer, my background's in architecture, and I also have um, a lot of interest in kind of mapping and visual, the visual arts and visual representation. So mm -hmm. I'm especially interested in how we share story through through kind of different methods of visual communication. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to kind of continue to bring my experience and excitement in those areas to the project. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the ways in which we're maybe already doing that work for Nookum's House and how that ties in with the decolonizing place narratives work. So yeah, so I think that I'll leave it there. <laughs> we go back to you, Ashley, and I can re-ask you to, um, 
describe your role, please, in the research project, if you will. Yeah, of course. Um, so I was saying my research role, my role in this project is a little bit less exciting, perhaps. Um, at this stage, I think it's going to get more exciting later on. So I work as a general research assistant in Kim Anderson's lab. So right now, me and her, I work with her on all things like administrative. Um, as I'm still in my undergrad, I am developing my own skills um, in terms of research and different things. So as far as this project goes, um, I've helped out in just scheduling and transcribing. But this summer, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the historical archives at the museum, hopefully. Um, and tag on a couple other little things that I can do. So I'm really, I'm grateful for this this opportunity to use it as a way to develop my own my own skills and bring whatever I can um, to the table. Awesome, and and I'll be because I saw everybody on the call. Um, you know, shaking their heads. No, there's no there's no role that's less exciting. Ashley, I'm going to say all roles are so uh, essential to these projects, especially ones that are um, so modular that have so many moving parts. Um, your your work in this and and your perspective um, are absolutely essential. And I know that our uh, that that the 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 scholars who are guiding all of us in this process feel the same way. <laughs> So thank you so much for sharing uh, each of you your your roles in the project. Um, I'd like to to sort of right out of the gate tackle tackle the big sort of driving question that was posed uh, uh, among the the researchers on the project that really centered sort of the efforts um, of what we saw happening over this year and the coming years um, as the project itself unfolds. And so I'll just I'll reread the question so we have it sort of centered and so our listeners can also hear it as well. And then I'll invite um, all of our uh, guests today to offer their reflections sort of initially in response to that to that big question, which is this. How do indigenous relationships with and along the speed in Aramasa rivers shape understandings of the city of Guelph as an indigenous place? Who would like to offer some initial thoughts? Alex? <laughs> yeah, I can start. Um, uh, well, for me, like water is life, and I think all land is indigenous and carries, you know, ecosystems that are essential to our health and well-being. So I think indigenous relationships give the land agency and they give the land autonomy, you know, where these ecosystems thrive. And we're in the midst of a climate crisis. So we're collectively needing to turn to indigenous knowledge and teachings to ensure the safety of the land and the water for, for future generations. And it's, it's having an understanding that every individual contributes to this. So I think really like localizing this research will help um, hopefully shape more folks relationship with the speed in Aramaso rivers. Um, and that we all contribute to um, to the sustainability of um, of the future generations. So beautifully phrased, um, and also uh, sort of re really brings it home in a really direct way, right? I mean, I think as as often I sort of refer to to humans as human animals, so we're drawn indescribably to the to the water. Um, and a p particularly at this time of year is sort of like teeming with life, teeming with activity and trying to understand and, and sort of center that relationship to give it voice to to um, uh, for 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 those who uh, bring their indigenous knowledge and heritages and, and ways of living to that space, for those who come from other spaces and are also engaging in the same way to build those sort of like bridges between between those uh, those experiences I think um, um, are, are what is one of the really exciting um, and compelling aspects of of this project and the work that we're doing. Um, Amina, would you like to offer your thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, so when I think about this question, kind of going back to uh, when you were describing to the research project, like thinking about Indigenous relationships, past, present and future in this place and how we're trying to kind of span, you know, span again, past, past present and future and thinking about how 
you know, like Alex said, all land here is Indigenous land. It's just a question of kind of awareness of that. Um, so I think we're really, you know, in looking at past relationships to land, um, the history of the place, we're, we're really hoping to um, recenter those narratives um, to kind of, again, bring that understanding of Guelph as an Indigenous place and kind of recenter those um, those relationships to land, the kind of um, the values and, you know, within, as Alex said, to um, within our kind of current climate crisis or emergency, um, what can we learn from past and present um, practices in terms of being in relation to the land, caring for the land, right, caring for the land that cares for us and um, so I, I suppose in terms of the way I, I've also been thinking about this in our work with Nipum's house, which um, which maybe I should just briefly, ex should I briefly explain sure. what Nipum's house is? Uh, Please. So Nipum's house is a, um, a proposed, uh, as I guess mentioned in my bio, a proposed Indigenous research lab um, at the University of Guelph, where it's happening. We're, we're in the design phase, working with an architect on it right now. And we've been working with community um, from the beginning to kind of uh, imagine what the space should be. And essentially, it's a space to serve um, the land based and community based research of Dr. Kim Anderson, Dr. Brittany Luby, and Dr. Sherry Longboat. So all three researchers already, um, you know, are already doing work within community. Um, and so it's it's a space to really house that work and also house all the students who work with them, uh, like and collaborators, community researchers and collaborators like all of us. You know, the the DPN project is kind of part of that umbrella of the work that'll happen within Nukum's House. And yeah, so that's kind of what Nukum's House is. But as part of the work there, I think that captures the kind of present relationship and future relationships that we're trying to build informed by past relationships. So we're we're working right now to have a place where Indigenous folks, researchers, scholars um, at the University of Guelph and in Guelph generally um, can have a place to do work in relationship with the land very directly. And so, yeah, so I maybe I'm rambling a little bit, but I think we're we're kind of living those relationships through this work as well, and um, and so I think all of this uh, will contribute to kind of building this awareness of Guelph as an indigenous place. And I I should maybe also mention that I don't I don't live in Guelph. I've I've been connected to Guelph through through our Nickham's House project for the last number of years, and I also spent spent a lot of my adult life in like the Cambridge Kitchener Waterloo area. So, um, you know, within the watershed. Uh, the Grand River watershed, which is, of course is connected to the Speed and Aramasa rivers, um, but in many ways I'm 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 perhaps not as connected um, to Guelph specifically, but I think that relationship has been building over over the years as well. So. Thank you so much, Amina. Uh, I mean, you've offered us so so much um, in just sharing your thoughts, and as I know, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we've posed it. And it has, um, I think, a, an evolving, uh, obviously an evolving set of, I, I hesitate to even say answers, really, because um, to me, that suggests that it sort of has an end or is finite. And I think what we're really doing um, in this work collectively is is we're, we're on sort of a, a continuous journey, right? It, it doesn't sort of begin or end with any of us here in this conversation, any of our listeners. Um, to the conversation, any of the other researchers and other collaborators who are contributing to the work that this project represents. Um, but to your point, uh, as you reference Nocom's House and um, you know all of the other threads of the work that you're doing, um, you know it's it, it is much much larger <laughs> and more complicated than uh, sort of the, what the scope of the research project sort of allows for. But I think at its heart, it is that sort of continuous journey, right? And the complexity of those relationships um, are are sort of surfacing in a in a host of ways, and will continue to do so. Um, Ashley, did you want to offer some thoughts from your perspective on? Um, how Indigenous relationships with and along the Speed and Aramasa rivers uh, shape understandings of the place we call Guelph. 
Yeah, for sure. So firstly, I really like the way that you put it, Dawn. I, when I think about, you know, the project and this question in particular, I think about it on like, we are a dot on this like time spectrum, right? It's been going for so long. It's going to continue going for so long. And we're here to kind of understand what we can and get that knowledge out there and, you know, just develop those those understandings at this point in time, but it's going to keep going and going, right? And similar to Amina, I am not from Guelph. I haven't actually been here for too long. I've only been here for maybe a couple of years. So I'm definitely stepping into this with a perspective a little bit different. But I think, like Alex said, we're all connected to the water. And that's something that we all can share in common. For example, I come from, my family comes from Listigush First Nation, and we are up up connected to the ocean um, on the northeastern side of Canada right now. And those connections with the ocean, I've come to understand over, like, at least my very limited, <laughs> very, um, you know, short experience with that. I can see how those connections and the, the importance carries over and we see similarities across the board. Um, so my time spent in Guelph, I've seen, I've gotten like a snapshot of the importance and the significance that the connection to the rivers, the, the speed and Aramosa rivers holds, right? And I just want to focus in, I guess when I thought about this question, I thought more about the last, the last part, understandings of the city of Guelph as an indigenous place. And for me, at least, that's what I see as super, super important is that it's it's forgotten, especially outside of certain circles. It's forgotten that not only Guelph, but all of Canada is an indigenous place, right? So this, and I'm trying to like form my thoughts as coherently as possible. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I I just like, I see this, I view this as an opportunity for us to just reiterate what is known and and transfer the knowledge that is already held in communities and transfer that out to people who unfortunately over time we've forgotten that that Guelph is an indigenous place just as an example. Thank you so much um, Ashley for recentering us on that point. Um, I think it's it's so critical because oftentimes we're sort of setting setting these relationships up in as a dichotomy. It's it's this and it's that or it's this or that. And actually um, that's a really, really essential uh, point to make. Um, I think in particular for this conversation and for the project that that is happening uh, with our collective involvement, um, but also in terms of how that message carries out to the community of folks who will be listening to this conversation. Um, shifting our, our framework and our understanding around place and our relationships to place. And we say, you know, we're, we're sort of locked in in the, in the sort of intention of this project around the place we now call Guelph, around the rivers we call Speed and Aramasa, because there's so much of the sort of localized lifeblood of this community. Um, but this community is an ancient community and the lands are ancient and the waters are ancient. So it's much, it's, it, it is, um, to your point exactly, um, absolutely, first and foremost, and always an Indigenous place. So from there, I would love to move into my next question, uh, which really, uh, I think, sort of suggests that some of the work of the of this uh, research team around sort of how we story place or how we restory place. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll phrase it this way. So where the rivers meet, or decolonizing place narratives, which is the name of the the formal name of the research project, is grounded in indigenous theoretical work that calls for restoring the erasure of indigenous peoples in settler colonial urban spaces. The research team is collecting data from local archives, gathering oral histories, and conducting site visits to reread places of historic and cultural significance. And I think um, what is most interesting as a as sort of a place to pivot our conversation for me is, is this question, what does restoring mean to each of you? And I wonder if I could ask you, Ashley, to start us off. For sure. So I think this definitely ties back into what I was just discussing. So to me, restoring does not mean writing a new story. Because in this you know, in this example, in this context, this story has existed. It has existed. 
And simply what we're doing is restoring. We are bringing that story back into the narrative and we're bringing that story back into the public um, to, to a community or to an audience that might have forgotten about it or might not know enough about it. So to me, restoring is something that's essential. And so what we're doing here is needed. And it's a it's it's a reminder to to ourselves and to the community to understand the place that we call home right now or the land that we are on right now. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. And I wondered, Amina, if you could build on what Ashley was describing. For sure. Um, yeah, I think I think about this term restoring a lot. I think um, like a, a big part of my my like thesis work, my master's thesis work was thinking about how we truly understand the context of the place we're we're in. And and from for me as a designer, you know, understanding your context when you design is so important. And I I kind of felt like I um like there was a huge piece of the context that was omitted from my my education when I when I was growing up and from my post-secondary education as well. And so for me, this restoring um, and as Ashley said, it's about kind of recentering or listening to the story of the land that has, of course, been there, but hasn't always been passed down in the mainstream. Right. And I think a big part of this in the work we're doing here and maybe also going back a little bit to the last question is really thinking about what it means to um, honor the treaties of this place too. So, um, and I, I think that under like that, that underpins all, all of this work, right? Like that kind of coming forward and to kind of recognize the treaties that are here that, that allow so many of us to be on these lands and that have, of course, um, you know, been agreements that have been broken. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, well, I guess we'll be getting into a lot of that through the research too and understanding that. And, you know, Brittany Luby um, and Emma Stelter in particular are, are really our kind of treaty uh, historians on the project. Um, and of course, Val, Val King, um, member of the Mississaugas of Credit, uh, the elder we're working with. So I think, yeah, thinking about this idea of, um, of reconnecting. For me, a lot of it is kind of reconnecting to the stories of the land. And maybe here I'll also add that part of what I've been doing or I've been trying to do more recently is trying to learn how to listen to and read the land, like, and our other than human relations on the land. Um, and so part of this project, uh, one thing that I'm doing right now, uh, me and um, a friend and colleague of mine or from from school, we went to school together, Danny Castellan, we're actually working on an exhibition um, at the uh, Cambridge Art Galleries right now. And as part of that, I'm, uh, I'm working on a piece that um, is intending to share, I guess, share a kind of map of, of our other than human relations on the site and gathering knowledge that, um, that or gathering information about our neighbors on the site uh, from from the last several years because we've been working on the land and trying to get to know that site. So restoring in the sense that bringing the stories of our other than human relations to to the forefront as well in this process. I feel like my, my mind's going all over the place and I'm thinking of all kinds of different things. But um, but that's certainly one aspect of restoring that I'm trying to work on right now in my own practice of understanding how to kind of listen to the stories of um, of the plants and the animals and the fungi and and how to kind of bring that into the forefront because I think honoring the treaties for me at least um, you know a lot of it comes back to kind of being in res in reciprocity with the land and so I've been trying to figure out okay well how how do I really do that if I don't know the land that well you know so part of part of it is kind of learning the land through the process so hopefully that answers that question somewhat. 
in in so many amazing ways amina let me just assure you of that um and and you have both ashley and amina you have uh, my mind is turning also and and things that are sort of bubbling up that i'm i'm so keen to share but i want to also hear you alex um your thoughts and response to um sort of what what restoring means to you in the context of this project for sure and i think it's just like echoing what ashley and amina were just saying like restoring to me is just like having autonomy within narratives like like amina was talking about in school like i grew up in this in the public school system where um my school and institutions you know taught um histories from like a single colonial lens so um where indigenous histories have always been positioned as in the past or they're no longer living or other either like romanticized or misunderstood. So I think restarting is like a powerful decolonial practice where um, like indigenous peoples um, of, of the land can, can reclaim their narratives and share it in a way that is appropriate to them and to their communities. Um, and I also just wanted to say too that I, I am not from Guelph as well. Um, I, I am based in Hamilton and um, so I am on the other side of the Grand River, um, but I have that deep connection with the land as well. And, and similar to Amina and, and her practice, I am also learning about what my relationship to my land is and to my traditional territory, but to my, my homelands as well in upstate New York. And, um, and what does it mean to to be on on this treaty land? Um, so like it's yeah, understanding like all of these responsibilities as well. So I think that restoring it's it's very layered, um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of responsibility that goes into it. Um, my as I said, thank you so much, Alex. As I as I said, I um, all of you have sort of triggered for me so red. <laughs> In some way, just in the context, of particular question, um, and what I'd like to offer is uh, when I encountered the language of restoring, I was thinking of it as storytelling, uh, like how do we tell the story of place, um, which is perhaps not a surprising thing for a museum curator to to pose a question around. But then, as I was hearing you, each of you speak and reflect. I was thinking about um, also, Ashley, you started off by saying that this is, this is not a new story. It's uh, it's a story that has been part of this place, all places, frankly, not just the place we call Guelph, but all places um, for time immemorial. And so perhaps restoring is also about restoring, restoring awareness to, the, to those truths, um, reconnecting people or connecting people in different ways. Um, you all shared that you're not necessarily from the place we now call Guelph, but the fact that each of you and myself as well have chosen to spend time in this place, that we have a, a, an obligation as, as um, uh, people on this land and, and in the water and connecting with the water um, to understand its story and then to understand how we're imposing our story in that space. So for me, you've just sort of broken wide open sort of the concepts of how we move through an idea of storying or restoring. And I know there will be lots, uh, lots to come in terms of that, um, of, of the journey that will lead us to that place. You know, the, this is a continuous journey, as we've already discussed in the context of where this research will go. Um, the project itself has an arc. Um, you know, it, it had a beginning and it will move through uh, a process and then conclude in some respects in an exhibition here in the museum something that I am beyond excited about, but I don't want to rush the process because it's really essential that we that we move to that place um, in a good way and that we do it in a way that, um, you know, that offers that reciprocity. I think that Ashley, you were you were talking about. Um, I'd like to move to another question, which of course it's all it's all connected. Um, but the question is this: so one of the goals of the project is to develop and implement arts, water, and land-based knowledge mobilization events and activities. And I know Alex, you talked a little bit when you were introducing your role in the project um, around uh, knowledge mobilization. Can you help us to understand what that is when we use that phrase? Yeah, to me, it's like it's activating the research developed throughout the project in order to make it accessible for all community members. 
And I think it's also like including us in the narrative as well in a present moment um, where the research or knowledge is not positioned in the past and that it's living and that there are other ways of sharing knowledge outside of books and museum didactics that um, that can engage all people of all ages. That's awesome. You've just sort of uh, really plainly shared what the, the language around knowledge mobilization. I'm for me now, I was also thinking about um, how how knowledge changes and over time and through space. That was one thing that I was also thinking about when I was uh, sort of wrestling with that terminology. Um, Ashley, do you have thoughts around knowledge mobilization and what that means to you? I think Alex hit it right on the head. Um, <laughs> I don't have too much to add, although I appreciate and I'm looking forward to the different ways and methods that that the knowledge will be mobilized. Because like she said, it can be shared outside of books. It can be shared outside of lectures. Um, yeah. And that's one key point that I'm super excited um, to see how that develops and how we can we can implement that and start that process. Lovely. Amina, did you want to jump in on the uh, on the question of what is knowledge mobilization? Sure. Um, I think maybe and maybe this is just kind of building on what was already said, but thinking about it as like knowledge is kind of transferred through relationship building too, I'd say, like kind of thinking about, you know, when we're talking about arts and water and land based knowledge mobilization, it's about kind of building connection and relationship with um, with each other and with the land. And I think like arts based methods and you know, it really it really engages you in, in a kind of direct experience. And, you know, as like as we were saying, the kind of accessibility of it is important. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, like reading publications, all that stuff, it, it's not something that's always as easy to engage with in a meaningful way, depending on on um, on the individual. But I think really in terms of building community, thinking about kind of community building within that knowledge mobilization is important. Um, yeah. So that that brings us really naturally to sort of part B of that question, which is how can or how do a creative experiences shift learning? I know that all of you are involved in, in a host of creative um, modes of expression. Uh, I mean, Amina and Alex, you are both uh, engaged in a curatorial context now, developing exhibitions and in, uh, in, in uh, for you, Alex, at uh, Hamilton Artists Inc. And Amina, you said you were working uh, with the Cambridge um, uh, galleries on a on a coming exhibition. Uh, Ashley, I'm not sure if you're engaged in something similar, but I'd love for each of you to share sort of um, maybe maybe if you could point to a specific creative experience that really is an example of how learning can shift in a significant way. And I know um, we're talking a lot or referencing a lot of sort of exhibition work, but recognizing that that creative experiences happen in a lot of different spaces in a lot of different ways, and we don't always use that language to describe those experiences. But I just I, I intend the question to be really, really open ended. Um, Alex, you're nodding, so I'm going to ask you uh, if there's something that that comes to mind as a, a sort of like a good example of what that is. Um, well, I just think about like how I started my my photography practice and just how powerful it was to be able to kind of ground yourself by like, you know, having your feet in the soil and or having your feet in the water because it brings like so much healing and people like really learn through that connection. So I think it's important that the activation or that the information is activated in, in more ways than one, and it's it's more than just tactile, right? So that was really been my experience, like with my photography practice was um, like, what does it mean to truly engage with land? Um, and so that was me like just living out this like creative expression of like my ancestors, like flowing through me and my ancestors, like feeling the connection through my body and with the land. Um, and you know like the land and, and all of creation they're they're interconnected and, and they carry so many teachings um which kind of goes back to like that indigenous knowledge and indigenous relationships so 
um, I, yeah, like I find just experiential learning and engaging with the land and waters like helps us build an understanding of like our responsibilities to care for them as well and like ensure like our longevity. So that's, I've been like really trying to like be more mindful of that, like especially in my practice, but just in my daily life as well. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Ashley, did you want to share your perspective on um, how creative experiences can shift learning? Yeah, for sure. So when thinking about this question, I kind of, I reflect back to my own experiences and the one that I am finding the most connection to right now is the experience that I've had is that I walk a very, a very interesting line. I walk the line between being an Indigenous person and also um, being a part of the Muslim community. So this is a very new experience um, that I haven't seen reflected a lot or I haven't been able to connect to many people on. Um, but through this experience, I found that the way that like one of the methods that has affected my learning the most has not been, you know, has not been lectures, it has not been readings, but rather it's been on the ground communication and deep conversation with people, with individuals or in small groups. And I think this might not be what somebody thinks of when they think of, I guess, creative knowledge mobilization. But for me, this is what has been the most impactful is sitting down with people and just talking and just talking and talking and if you know indigenous people we like to talk a, a lot it can go on for quite a long time in small groups this has been the way that that i have at least personally felt that i've learned the most and come to understand my identity and also my place you know in the world that i live in in the place that i live in um so i hope that answers the question that's just me speaking to my own experiences Absolutely. And and there's uh, please know there's no right or wrong wrong way to answer any of these questions. So, you know, um, I'm just grateful to all of you. Um, and, I'll, and I'll say especially in this moment to you, Ashley, for sharing that very personal perspective and and for uh, reminding us that communication is also a creative experience that I think sometimes when we're uh, chatting with each other, I mean, we are gathered at the moment virtually uh, dealing with our technology, looking at each other on us uh, on our various screens. Um, and I still feel so incredibly connected to each and every one of you and thinking also about sort of a, um, a community of people who will be listening to this conversation um, and, you know in a couple of days time it'll be live and broadcast shared I shouldn't say live broadcast um, and uh, and wondering and, and hoping frankly that um, that the model if you will of this kind of sharing um, might encourage folks to turn to their communities, to their families, to their partners and and sort of um, reflect and think about their own relationships. So I think absolutely communication is a key part of sort of how we are as creative beings. Um, Amina, I want to uh, ask you too for your thoughts in that regard. Uh, absolutely. Um, I was thinking about just as we were talking but how with knowledge mobilization, especially in research contexts, we often think about, OK, the research happens and then we need to kind of share that or broadcast it or, you know, share it with a wider audience. But um, I think. Hopefully what we're trying to do and also. Um, in our approach to knowledge mobilization is it's not just that kind of one directional sharing, right? It's like having these more creative experiences or. Um, really involving every participant in the process and having an opportunity for everyone to kind of share or engage directly in something. Um, there's also more knowledge being shared between between those who are participating in, in whatever activity or event that is. And so in my mind, um, you know, I can maybe I'll do a little shout out to the class I'm teaching right now. Like so um, my students for one of the first assignments um, in the course I'm teaching, uh, and this was inspired by a lot of um, like other instructors I've known and and kind of just practices of sharing about your own personal position kind of at the start of, of any endeavor. Um, but each student did um, did a kind of visual representation of their own relationships to land. So kind of thinking about their own land stories and their own personal experience and 
it was kind of an arts based method, I guess, right? We do a lot of drawing and design work at the architecture school. So it's something that I think, you know, we're used to doing, uh, but maybe not always used to telling a story, kind of a personal story through through that work. Um, but I thought that was so powerful because we were all learning from each other because, you know, as each student would share about their own relationship to land, um, it, yeah, we, we kind of, we had an opportunity to engage um, very personally with each other and, and kind of, yeah, again, I guess, learn, learn from each other. And I think that's so important in these knowledge mobilization processes um, so that people are, are very directly, like community is very like directly engaged in that process of, of learning. And, and, and again, it's not just like, oh, okay, us as a research team, we're trying to kind of just, you know, direct or information out there without without that personal engagement with that as well. I know we're speaking kind of vague terms because we're not talking about like specific activities necessarily, but but I think engaging those who we're trying to share knowledge with in kind of creative expressions or, or creative activities, I think can be really um, transformative. So. I think what each of you has shared is uh, has has sort of provided ways in which um, uh, listeners to this conversation might bring some of these processes into their own sort of awareness into the way in which they connect both with land and water, but also with the people um, and other beings in their lives that uh, they interact with and connect with uh, day over day. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that is um, really distinctively different in this research project compared, for example, with a lot of other kinds of research projects that uh, this museum would be a part of um, and has been a part of in past is that we're really paying, we're being very attentive to the process and, and prioritizing that journey over the outcome. I mean, I as curator, I'm really excited about the possible outcome that we would call an exhibition. But for me, that's that's a moment in time, a pause in a trajectory of learning and of sharing and of relationship building. Um, and, and I'll be delighted um, when it happens and the way that it happens. But I think um, it's really special um, and especially because it's it still feels new to center so much of the work in the process, in the relationship building, in knowing each other, even through this conversation in a host of ways. Um, um, you know, knowing our communities, uh, where they where they cross paths and where they're where, where they intersect and where they don't intersect in literal ways, but how to bring uh, sort of those knowledges into play um, in each of our lives as we go about our days, as we connect with, with the world around us, um, sort of naturally brings us into sort of the next uh, question that I've prepared, which really uh, centers on that intersectional uh, point around the Speed and Aramasa rivers, uh, which ref represent, I think, um, the convergence and divergence of Indigenous and settler ways of living and knowing. Um, from Indigenous living, living and traveling on the rivers, I had said before and at the establishment of Guelph to present day, but I'd really love to rephrase that and say past, present and future. Um, so from from your perspectives, how might this project shift individual and collective relationship to the rivers? I see reflective, pensive expressions, so. <laughs> Alex, do you want to start us off? Sure, yeah, I, I think that um, the research is going to be activated in a way that not many people have maybe experienced before. And um, land-based knowledge mobilization activities are going to be, engage folks in a different way that also offers the connection to the rivers. And I hope that it will shift perspective and offer folks kind of a place to reflect on their own learnings and, and understandings of, of histories that kind of span outside of the colonial narrative. And hopefully um, on an individual level, encourage dialogue and you know, further learnings and to be critical and, and challenging um, other colonial narratives. Um, and then through, hopefully through the project, folks will be more 
um, aware and protective of the water, you know, as an individual, but also as a, as a collective. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Ashley, did you want to build on that? Yeah, for sure. So when I think about the impact that I hope that the project and I think the project will have, um, I guess at the collective level, I'm hoping that it will impact the wider, you know, the wider community to understand, like Alex said, just the importance and the value that lies in the in the existence in the in the rivers and viewing them at least as more than just something that is there or something to be, you know, taking resources from, but rather giving them the respect that they deserve as an integral part of not only the city of Guelph, but just, you know, in general, the, the importance that they that they demand, actually. I, I like how you reactioned your language there, uh, and I feel exactly the same way, Ashley. Um, Amina, did you want to jump in? Yeah, not, not too much to add necessarily, but um, yeah, I think just as you write, like shifting, shifting our relationship with the rivers in a way that um, that really leads us collectively to care for for the waters and the land. Um, I think, you know, it's it's really urgent actually that that our relationship with our, you know, with Mother Earth, with the land that provides for us shifts and and, you know, the focus or that kind of connection of understanding how the land and the waters provide for us, how, you know, how water is life. And like that, that is something that I think kind of in the general um, consciousness is not, is still, it's still maybe missing or, or needs to be strengthened. And so I think for me, my hope is that, um, that this, this project can really recenter those reciprocal relationships and, of course, within an Indigenous um, framework, right, within the framework of this land. Um, and yeah, so I think it's about, and how, how we do it, I guess, is the question, right? That, yeah, how, how we're going to do it, which is like hopefully building those relationships again with, with the waters and the land, sharing those stories that connect us to the waters um, and the land and the animals and, you know, all, all of the beings um, that we share this life with right so the kind of in interconnections of all of that so yeah it's really about that kind of shift i i would uh so love to um bring us back over time throughout the course of uh of this research journey to sort of circle back on some of the questions that we've been posing and uh and reaching towards um to in today's conversation and um we don't have a lot of time together left in the sort of this formal, somewhat formal dialogue, but um, I'd, uh, you know, we've we've referenced the fact uh, that, you know, that the, the museum is a partner on the project, um, that there is a, an, an exhibition to come anticipated to open in fall of 2023. Um, all of the um, scholars on the project um, are, are artists uh, who have very diverse and, um, and um, powerful practices and and work both within and outside of museums and gallery spaces and in, in a kind of um in a way that is sometimes fluid and sometimes intentionally full of tension and challenge and i'm really interested in sort of igniting um that space in the context of what we're doing here in the museum specific to our role in the research project but then also to our larger role um, and obligation to our community and all the people who are sort of spending some time in the place we now call Guelph. Um, those that 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 have, were born here and raised and are raising their families here. Um, those that have come and to settle to choose this place to be their home for for the next long while. Um, shorter long while, I guess, guess I should say. So I'm really interested in sort of critiquing that space with with you in this conversation. Um, I'm interested to hear from you. What are what do you think some of the opportunities and challenges are in presenting an exhibition as 
outcomes of this of this research journey uh, within the museum. Maybe Amina, you could start us on that process. Sure. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, I guess museums are historically and perhaps still very colonial spaces um, and often, you know, represent kind of violence um, at times. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I'm not I'm no expert in this area of by any means, but I think even figuring out how we disrupt those systems, those kind of uh, of you know what the museum the kind of institutions um, like museums represent uh, those kind of colonial institutions and yeah what I, I guess that's part of the question of this project right how do we challenge that in our work like how do we center um, relationships and maybe maybe this goes back to even the forms of knowledge mobilization right because and centering like relationships and kind of a kind of ongoing exchange and creativity among you know within community which like even within our research team um and also how we just kind of take up space i guess within museums um and yeah i don't know i'm still it's a question that I think I'm, I'm constantly asking and you know we even with the work I'm I mentioned that I'm doing uh, at the Cambridge Art Galleries right now thinking about yeah how we how we disrupt those spaces but I think even just existing within those spaces maybe and I'm sure Alex has a lot more to add about about these questions mm -hmm. uh, but yeah please do Alex if you <laughs> 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 yeah well it's it's along the lines of exactly what you're saying Amina um that museums like they haven't always been safe spaces for indigenous black racialized folks um and they've often like misrepresented like sacred items and communities and again like positioning us in the past so museums have not always been trusted spaces. So I think that in itself might deter indigenous black racialized people from engaging with a museum exhibition. And also to like didactics on the wall, um, they can also be intimidating where the, ling the language is like, you know, sometimes inaccessible and curating in itself has, has been an extractive colonial practice. And um, and they haven't always been directly engaged with communities, so I'm always like hyper aware of that in my work, and to again like try to like dismantle that and and understand like what my role is um, in terms of like curating and you know working within these spaces. But on like the flip side, like there that opportunity, you know exactly what you're saying, Amina. Like that it is powerful for like a group of Indigenous women conducting research and taking up space within institutions. It's so powerful for a community to like see see that and for youth as well to like feel inspired and to also take up space within institution. And um, and I think that like the land-based activities like on top of like the museum exhibition will help like bridge these gaps and like there will be like further conversations and um, and then also too, I think it is like a positive thing that um, the museum exhibition will also gauge with seller communities as well and encourage their learning and understanding. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, Ashley, uh, I'm sure you have some thoughts that you'd also like to share along these lines. You know, the museum environment is not something that I've actually stepped into yet, so I'm very interested to see you know, how these things that that Amina and Alex have been discussing play out, especially on our end, because it. I've only been, you know, a visitor to, you know, those big museums in the States or whatever. So to me, at least I can speak from what I what I've seen and experienced is that when I think about it in the context of my own self and my own work that I look forward to in the future, it like Alex said, it hasn't seemed accessible. So to see this group to see this research group going ahead and, and doing this work, I'm I'm very excited. That's that's all that I'll say. I'm very excited um, and interested to see to see how this plays out and to understand, you know, the challenges and and the what is the word? The challenges and also the 
just the wins, I want to say the wins or the, you know, unexpected happy moments that come about um, surprises. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all about this. I was going to say, Ashley, I'm all about the surprises. <laughs> <laughs> we'll totally call them wins uh, when they happen, and we'll we'll uh, we'll recognize. Um, I, I I hesitate to say losses, but I I do I do also um, see tremendous amount of value in uh, making mistakes and 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 accept like embracing risk and doing things differently. Um, and sometimes, and I can speak to this from both within the museum and, and uh, outside of it as somebody who visits museums and other spaces, they can seem like these monumental, um, immovable mountains, if you will. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, this museum in particular, like in the context of the place we call Guelph and the work we do together in this project and the community that we share, whether we we're visitors for a short amount of time or we're here for a long time. Um, I think we, you know, in this work, we have a, a, a real opportunity to um, lean, lean hard into the critique, lean hard into, um, you know, demanding of the space what it needs to give in order to support this project um, in, 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 the, in a good way. Um, and so I, I'm, uh, like you, I'm I'm equally excited and also I'm really keen to sort of pull back the layers and try to figure out how through this journey um, we can offer to community, both community who who has a trusting relationship with the museum, but more importantly, I would suggest community who does not have relationship with the museum or has a relationship that is full of violence. Um, and trying to trying to create space and capacity to shift that relationship in a way that is wanted and needed. Um, so that so that you know, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what that exhibition will look like um, when it comes to be. Um, as I said, I, I sort of carefully phrased it, anticipated to open in fall of 2023 because I also know what research journeys are. <laughs> Well, let's say life journeys, maybe not just research journeys, but life journeys um, evolve in the way that they, they they do. And I think, you know, to do honor to this process is to say that, um, you know, uh, uh, we can see that in our sites now, um, but it's it's the collective team of people and, and the many folks who maybe are not yet part of this project who will become part of the project over time uh, that will really sort of dictate and shape you know what what that outcome might look like but meanwhile so much work uh is happening so much relationship is happening and um and i'm just so honored uh to spend a little bit of time with uh all three of you in this conversation as we sort of set set ourselves uh the journey ahead um i have one last question uh and i i if, if you're all good with time i'm i'm gonna ask it uh great Given that we're at the beginning of a research journey that is sure to expand and grow in many, many ways, how will this project and others like it shift future understandings of place? Amino, let's start with you. Sure. Um, how will it shift it? Maybe, maybe this does come back to to this kind of recentering of the land and waters for me. Um, uh, and maybe I'll also say that there have been a lot of projects like this in other places, and I think it's so important that these projects happen mm -hmm. in everywhere, especially. I think this these are the kinds of projects that need to happen in every colonial city, um, settler colonial city, I guess, specifically in this country and and I just really hope that you know and you know the the changes are already happening I think these shifts in understanding have been happening um I've seen a shift even in my like since I was in school to seeing students now um but I do hope that you know this project and similar ones can really um build this understanding of place and how we live and work in relationship uh, with 
yeah, with the places where we are and um, and just to strengthen our relationship with place, I guess. So maybe it's a kind of vague answer, but but I, I really am excited for the power of, you know, of that restoring that um, of how that shifts our our relationship to place and how we operate in relation to place and land and water. Um, and, you know, honoring honoring our ancestors as well, honoring the future generations to come. I think that's such a big part of this, right? Like thinking about how, what kind of ancestors we're going to be. Um, yeah, there's so much, there's so much in this project and I'm just excited for all of it. And I do hope that it shifts things for the better and, you know, some good news and exciting projects like this is so needed right now, I find. And I'm just appreciative um, for this conversation and yeah, really, really appreciative for this work and being able to do this together. Thanks so much, Amina. Um, Ashley, did you want to offer some reflections on the future understandings of place? For sure. So like Amina, I think I might give a semi vague answer um, because this is something that we're coming to understand and looking forward to the future. I think that the way that understanding shifts is going to vary. It's going to vary greatly across the communities that the information is delivered to in the communities that the information hits, right? But I'm not going to say I hope, I'm going to say I am confident that that the information and the knowledge mobilization methods that we use and, and what we share to the wider community is going to impact it in a great way and in a meaningful way that will make us all think a little bit more, at least at least make us think a little bit more about, you know, where we're situated and, and what our roles are in, in our daily, you know, our daily English is escaping me, daily lives, I'll say. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley, and your your enthusiasm and your confidence is infectious. So please carry that with you. I'm sure that you do, and thank you for sharing it with us today. Uh, and I'll say, um, final word for the moment, over to you, Alex. How do you see, mm -hmm. um, uh, how, how does this project for you shift future understandings of place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to like jump on what Ashley was saying, I think the project is going to be like a really great entry point for more projects like these in the future um, that we need to, you know, just keep challenging and dismantling colonial systems. And again, like I'm so, so, so scared of the climate crisis. And I think, the, you know, the more knowledge that we have and as we're like building these relationships with the land, it's going to help ensure the sustainability of, of the land and water and future generations. And um, meanwhile, honoring our, our ancestral knowledge and building a better future. So um, yeah, I think like we need to be thinking long-term and, and I think this project play, plays a beautiful role in this as well. Thanks so much, Alex and, and Amina and Ashley too for spending uh, this time together uh, in conversation uh, with me and with our community. Um, I am like you, uh, this conversation has uh, inspired me, has centered me, uh, has um, given me an incredible pause for thought and I hope that that is um, uh, carried out into the audience that will listen to this conversation over over the over the next long while. Um, so the research project where the rivers meet decolonizing place narratives uh, continues I'll, I'll say into 2024. We know that much for sure um, and there will be many other parallel projects that I think emerge as you were saying Alex out of out of the work of this uh, this particular group. Um, for listeners who are keen to learn more um, Definitely, uh, I, we will be sharing news of the project as uh, as those sort of mobilization moments emerge and connect with community in a host of ways. Um, but I encourage you in the meantime to uh, visit the Where the Rivers Meet. Uh, I'll say it's a living display currently on view in the museum. Um, it's an installation that uh, reaches to the true histories of the place we now call Guelph and is continually shaped and changed by the visitors who engage with it um, as we listen, as we learn and as we unlearn together. 
Um, so I hope uh, that visitors will 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 come to the space and and bring their own ideas and experiences and reflections, uh, and that they'll leave some of that um, in the space uh, when they decide uh, to to move on in their day. Um, Join us again, if you will, uh, for our listeners uh, to History Bites on Wednesday, July 20th uh, at noon for History Bites Moving Histories, Neighborhood Mysteries, when we'll be in conversation with community story to, uh, advocates, including the Guelph Film Festival and the Guelph Neighborhood Support Coalition. Um, so that'll be also a really interesting conversation to come in a few weeks time. Uh, so be well and stay safe. And thanks so much again.